So, um, welcome to Pharma 4.0, Embracing Opportunities for Information in a Digital World. I'd like to introduce Helen Malone, who is Director of the Information Hub at GlaxoSmithKline and President of the Pharma Documentation Ring. A key part of our mission at Contech uh, is to cover specific or, or market sector or, or issue-driven sectors to learn about and discuss and share best practice. And I think pharma is a great example of this. And so we wanted to uh, hold this initial very market-focused session. Um, and in future conferences, all being well, we'll, we'll look forward to examining other sectors uh, in greater depth as well. So specifically now, Helen will highlight the impact of the explosion of global data and will provide examples that illustrate how we, as information professionals, are uniquely positioned to collaborate and lead the opportunities that arise from the intersection of technology, data, and science to generate knowledge and insights for our organizations. So with that, over to you, Helen. Thank you very much, Dan. Hello, everyone. It's great to be part of this very first Contech event. And I'm delighted to have been invited to speak about opportunities for information in a digital healthcare world. My name's Helen Malone, and I'm the director of the Global Information Hub at GSK. I'm also the president of the Pharma Documentation Ring, or the PDR, as it's better known. Just for my own reference, how many of you have heard of the PDR? That's great, I can see some familiar faces in, in, the, in the audience. So I'd just like to give you a, a bit of an insight about who we are. So we're a group of knowledge managers uh, from 28 of the pharmaceutical companies in the world. And the collaboration we have really provides a, a very vibrant information community um, where we partner together on issues of importance to the industry. And this is what really makes the PDR unique. So I don't want to spend too much time on our long and prestigious history. But during our 60 years together, amongst other successes, we were the first to create a model license for electronic journals in 2002. And this was actually a real breakthrough for both the PDR and for publishers because it gave a new framework from which to negotiate in what was then a relatively new electronic information era. More recently, we were the first to articulate the need for seamless access to global data anytime, anywhere. And this call to action was really a very important step in the formation of what is now the jointly sponsored NISO and STM initiative on resource access in the 21st century, or RA21. And the remit of RA21 is to recommend authentication standards beyond IP and move to a much more flexible, simple, and trusted access model. So I find it remarkable that 28 competing pharma companies working together collaboratively really has had this influence on the information industry. And from a personal perspective, it's really put me in a privileged position to have a much more rounded, more informed view of the bigger global challenges and opportunities facing our profession. So as Dan said, I'm here today to really look at the future of information in a digital healthcare world, and also the effects of the explosion of that global data. So firstly, I'd like to look at the larger context for this healthcare and digital health revolution. So what do we mean by digital health? Well, according to Paul Sonnier, who's the author of the book, Digital Health, The Fourth Wave, digital health is the convergence of digital and genomic technologies with health, living, and society. And what I feel is really important about this definition is that the combination of tech and big data really promises much more targeted, much more effective medicines, and also the ability for us to live healthier lives for longer. 
However, this vast amount of growing digital data is really causing an absolute massive disruption in the pharma and healthcare industry. And it seems that everyone wants a piece of this digital action. For example, tech companies are wading in with their technically advanced gadgetry, and they have the potential to drastically alter this digital health landscape. For example, you may be aware that Google is diving much deeper into the healthcare sector with its absorption of DeepMind's healthcare unit. And amongst other advances, it plans to develop AI-powered apps to help healthcare practitioners manage patients. Many of us have Apple devices, such as phones and watches, which capture enormous amounts of real-time data and fitness information. And Microsoft's CEO was recently quoted as saying that AI can change the trajectory of healthcare. I feel the competitive advantage that these tech companies have is their ability to be agile and to develop innovative, intuitive products in response to the market. Meanwhile, pharma companies are starting to slowly transform themselves to try to keep up with this digital data revolution. For example, GSK and Verily, which was formerly Google Life Sciences, created a company called Galvani Bioelectronics in 2016. Galvani is developing miniaturized implantable devices which can modify electrical signals that pass along the nerves in the body. There's considerable excitement within GSK about the potential of these bioelectronic devices because they could potentially treat chronic diseases such as arthritis, diabetes, and asthma. More recently, GSK has announced a multi-year collaboration with 23andMe to use human genetics for the basis of discovery and development of new medicines. Hal Barron, the chief scientific officer at GSK, recently said, we're very excited about this unique collaboration because we know that drug targets with genetic validation have a significantly higher chance of ultimately demonstrating benefit for patients and becoming medicines. So in order to get the most value from this explosion of global data, GSK and other pharma companies will need to invest really heavily in advanced analytics capabilities, including artificial intelligence and machine learning. And this innovative combination of AI with pharma has really only been possible in the last three or four years because of the significant increase in computing power and also the ability to store, access and analyze enormous amounts of information and data. So I believe this combination of digital data and analytics will be fundamental in driving forward the digital healthcare revolution. So what does this digital healthcare revolution mean for us, for our industry, and for our future roles? Are we experiencing a love-hate relationship with the enormous amounts of data that we have access to? Will there ever be a balance where we feel comfortable with the amount of data that we consume? Or better still, will the necessary digital infrastructure ever be in place to allow us to digest this never-ending stream of new information? I believe to help answer these questions, we need to bridge the gap between the information and tech industries, we need to build on the complementary skills between our disciplines. 
And we need to work together to exploit those opportunities in digital data and analytics. I feel the information industry itself is at a tipping point. The exponential growth of data provides both a challenge and an opportunity. A challenge because we need to use technology to be able to draw, derive insights from this big data. And an, and an opportunity because we now have the tools and the techniques to be able to do this. As a result, many traditional scientific, medical, and technical publishers are reinventing themselves as technology and analytics companies. For example, publishers are investing heavily in machine learning, in ontologies, in semantic searching, and also in structuring and analyzing and integrating this new data. This reinvention process to combine both data and tech is an important shift in the information industry. As I think about my own global department at GSK, I realize this combination of information and tech has become extremely valuable. I recently had a wake-up call from our new Chief Data and Technology Officer who challenged my team to become much more digital and tech-savvy. I find it fascinating that I was suddenly having conversations with groups in GSK, such as computational sciences and other analytics groups that I recognize as building on the existing skills that we already have. For me, this was proof that the combination of expert information and data skills, extensive scientific knowledge, and technical expertise are what we need to move forward. So what does forward look like? I think we need a dynamic transformation of our environment. And this place could be a meeting of minds where information and data scientists share ideas, approaches, and skill sets. Within GSK, we've started on this journey. For example, information scientists in my group are beginning to work on joint projects with data scientists using semantic searching and visualization techniques across both internal and external data and information. We need to break down the barriers and to remove the silos. I believe this is essential in order for us to be able to have fair data, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. I feel we have a unique opportunity to create a new ecosystem between data and tech and to become an even more vibrant, innovative knowledge community. The PDR is a good example of an information community that already has a strong existing foundation that I believe we can build on and make a significant contribution to shaping this future. If in 10 years' time this has happened, what might it look like? I think information, data, and tech will continue to become critical enablers of personalized healthcare anytime, anywhere. I expect genomics and patient or consumer-generated information to become increasingly important. I see machine learning and AI being much more embedded into the drug discovery process. I anticipate augmented reality will have become mainstream. And we will have moved on to 5G, the fifth generation of mobile networks. As a result, the Internet of Things will have become much more embedded into our work and our home lives. For example, we will see the lab of the future being a connected, data-rich environment 
that allows scientists to interact with each other and their experiments in novel, virtual and innovative ways. In summary, I feel the emphasis for our future healthcare will move much more towards predicting and present, preventing disease rather than treating it. It won't be long before your virtual doctor tells you how to change your lifestyle before you develop a life-changing condition. And all of this will have been made possible by the combination of digital data and analytics. There will, of course, be challenges as well. We, as a society, will need to ensure privacy, security and accessibility to ensure a level playing field for everybody. We're living through a time of unprecedented transformation. We should be confident that we have the skills, the knowledge and the foresight to embrace the opportunities presented by the digital healthcare world. Thank you very much for listening. Helen, thank you very much. Uh, as is usual, I'd like to open this out to the floor and uh, invite questions of, and uh, further comments in case anybody has any. Thanks, Helen. <clears throat> That's a great presentation. Um, I just wondered what advice you might have for us as a content community from your insights within your business. What are the things that you think we could be focusing on to help this uh, digital healthcare world come to fruition? I certainly think, uh, I know Jabe, you're, you're from Elsevier, and, and I, know, I th certainly think that Elsevier has made great strides in this direction of moving Elsevier much more towards the technology and analytics company. Um, I think that the main thing for me is breaking down these silos. So we need to be able to integrate all the data from all the publishers that we subscribe to and with our internal data. So if there's a way of collaborating across the industry, that's something that I think would give, bring enormous benefit, both for us as companies and, and for patients as well. So, I mean, you mentioned fair data. I think that's probably a great kind of uh, move in that direction, I assume. Yes, absolutely. Yes, thank Thanks. you. Yeah. Any, anyone else? Um, I mean, to, to build on that, uh, the, the challenges around the, that cooperation and, and sharing more, did you have to have a view on specifically what those might be or, or what you know, the next step could be to, to take to help facilitate that change? I certainly think actually we can do a lot more within our own companies. Um, so we, we are still rather siloed within our companies. As I mentioned during my talk, information scientists within my group are starting to work quite closely with digital scientists. Um, I think we also need to have um, a very comprehensive and coordinated digital data and analytics strategy across the company, irrespective of organisational boundaries. So I think within our individual companies, I think we can do a lot more to, to negotiate and navigate that information landscape, irrespective uh, as to which or part of the organisation it comes from. Hi, Helen. So, um, a question for you. Uh, GSK subscribes to a lot of content, correct? How much of that content do you actually use from an AI perspective or you are allowed to use from an AI perspective? Um, and I assume you plan on doing more regardless, but can you comment on that? Yeah, so that, that's something I didn't bring up in the talk, but licensing is a big issue for the external content that, that we license, and we do have some agreements with some publishers, but it's a bit patchy at the moment. So the more that you could do as publishers to help us get those rights and to enable us to use that AI across that content, the better. I mean, we're certainly moving in the right direction, but we really need the ability to be able to mine that data across whichever publisher it is, and then combine it with our internal data as well. So we've made some steps towards that, but there's a lot further we need to go.
Yeah, really interesting on this licensing. I'd be really interested to hear what your view, I don't know if you could say it on behalf of GSK, is on, um, I mean, one way to solve the problem is to make all the information open and get rid of the paywall. Um, you don't need RA21 if everything's open access. So um, what's your views on uh, um, the, um, the, the option S model that's happening in Raging and all the petitions that are getting signed right now? Because that would solve the problem of interoperability pretty quickly. Yeah, that might be a better question for a publisher, actually, that, rather than me. But obviously, but someone from, who's paying for from, it. from our perspective, we, we would clearly want um, to have access to scientific information as open as, as possible. Um, so the, the further we can move towards that, that the better. But obviously, we respect you know, intellectual property rights. You know, within a pharma company, we have... Um, intellectual property for our drugs, so we respect that, and copyright with, with the publishers. So I think there's a balance to be had between open access and, and content that you pay for. I'm not sure we're ever going to get to the point where, where we won't pay for some of that information because of the added value that the publishers do in order to, to then uh, justify paying for that content. So I think it's going to be a balance between open science and also the added value that publishers uh, pay uh, put, put into that to enable us to, to pay for that content. Um, so obviously, as, as interoperable as we can make it, either through licensing agreements or through open access content, uh, the better. I think I heard a few publishers sighs of relief that there's still money to be had there. <laughs> and any, any other questions? I, um, I have one just to, to push forward in, into the personalization piece, and you mentioned things like... Um, uh, 23 and me uh, have you had discussions about that balance we, we touched on this in some of the earlier sessions between privacy and if you like benefit and, and how, do, how do you walk that very delicate line especially in the healthcare space uh, between dealing with sort of anonymized information or dealing with those privacy issues and, and making the kind of information discoveries that you need to yeah, so that, that's a very interesting question. So for us, in terms of 23 me, it's very early stages. We only signed this agreement uh, a month or so ago, a couple of months ago. Um, so we will only be seeing the anonymized data rather than the, 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 the individual data. And um, people will have chosen to, to make that available for uh, research purposes. Uh, but you're right, so that, that privacy piece is, is going to be a huge... Uh, it's going to be a huge issue for the industry and for, and for society going forward because obviously we want the benefit of this personalised health care but we also need to balance that against privacy. So I think that's going to be something that's going to evolve over the next few years. But it's certainly something that's very important for us to consider um, as we, as we uh, develop this personalised medicine. Any more for any more? I think going on from that particular point is the anonymization of the data which you're getting in for analysis purposes, uh, but also to create the customized health care for individuals. You probably have to need to know uh, their identity. And for that purpose, you're going to have a database full of uh, personal information, which, and again, the privacy issue raises its head. And of course, the the use of that from you know by people like the insurance companies for life insurance assessment. Needless to say, they'll use their data to assess. Okay, a person of this age and this weight and this BMI is going to have a higher or, you know, a higher risk and a higher premium. Um, so therefore, the again the privacy issue is going to rest at your door if it's that's an issue. And also, you'll have to be able to police who is allowed to get access to any of that information and to make sure it doesn't end up into, for example, the life insurance companies downstream. Yeah, I mean, you're quite, quite right. Mm. I mean, in real-world data, I mean, we're, we're still fairly new into, into the area of real-world data, and that's certainly going to be uh, a serious consideration going forward. Um, Wasn't me. <laughs> Far along. We're just checking if it's a test or not. Well, very quickly, thank you so much, Helen. Um, thank you. It's just a test.